money. That's all people seem to talk about when they talk about public schools. I don't think we spend enough money in our public schools. If you put money into a system that has no standards, you're not going to get anything out of it. We ought to have a good education every place. I mean, that's good policy. Nobody can be against that. The only question, who's going to pay for it? Why should we be treated different? Why should they get more money than us? When we want to learn, too. Bureaucrats aren't bad people. Bureaucracy is bad. It's the system that's bad. I think that our school system does very well despite what the naysayers in our own state say. Basically, money equals opportunity. We spend $220 billion a year on public schools and millions more on lawyers fighting about how to spend it. How do we raise that money? What do we spend it on? And what are we getting for all those dollars? You should know the answers to those questions because after all, it's your money. The Merrill Report, It's Your Money, is made possible by the people of Toyota. And by the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Pew Charitable Trusts. Citizens of the United States have certain fundamental rights, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of worship. These are guaranteed in the United States Constitution. What we don't have is a fundamental right to an education. Education is not even mentioned in the Constitution. Now that means it's left up to the states. States, by and large, leave it up to local communities. They leave it up to 15,500 school districts. It's almost as though people went to 15,500 different countries. Uh, <laughs> and each country had a different standard of educational living. Those standards of educational living vary dramatically within our 15,500 school districts, from state of the art to state of decay, often depending on how much money communities can raise. You can find the differences almost anywhere. We begin in New Hampshire. Scott and Deborah La Liberté are up well before dawn. High school English teachers start their days early. Seven years of teaching for Deborah and four for Scott have not made this early morning routine any easier. They share a hurried breakfast, glance at the newspaper, and leave by 6.30. At the end of the driveway, Deborah heads north to Franklin High School in Franklin, New Hampshire. Scott drives south to Amherst, New Hampshire. His destination is Sauhegan High School, built in 1991 at a cost of $12 million. I still remember pulling in the driveway and there's a nice granite bound fence and all the green spaces and I drove up and went, ooh, <laughs> we ain't in Kansas anymore. <laughs> and what was your reaction when you saw Scott's school? Ah. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> it was. I just remember pulling up and, and saying to him, this is where you teach. This can't be real. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then when I went inside and saw the, the, the almost like the atrium and the marble like and yeah. the stairways and his classroom and how well lit it was and climate controlled and all the right materials, I was very impressed. Scott's school is impressive. Classroom walls can easily be moved to make smaller spaces for learning. The gym is expansive. The auditorium is state-of-the-art. There's even a mini-gym to practice rock climbing. How would you describe his school? Mm. The way a school ought to be. Amherst can afford a school like this because it's a wealthy town with valuable homes, and property taxes pay 90% of the cost of public schools in New Hampshire. With all these valuable homes, Amherst can set its property taxes at a relatively low rate, $24 per thousand, and still raise enough money to spend about $7,000 per student. Deborah teaches in Franklin, 45 miles from Amherst. Homes here are worth a lot less than those in Amherst. And even though Franklin's homeowners pay higher property taxes, $28 per thousand, they raise only $4,200 per student. $4,200 doesn't buy much for Deborah's school. Built in 1938, Franklin High School shows its age. The main doors are broken. Ceilings need painting. Bathrooms are falling apart. 
There's asbestos underneath the gym floor and in the ceiling of the music room. Most everyone here will tell you that classes are overcrowded. There are three geometry classes for the junior class for the school, and I'm in the smallest one. It has around 30 students, maybe even 32 students. It's really hard when you have like 30 people in a classroom because you can't move forward. There's so many people that don't know the material. You should be able to come into a year and start out, go, review a little, and then so you can advance. And I'm learning stuff now. It's like two months into the, the year that I learned last year. I don't really even need to know. All your due dates are there. Chip Nyan has been teaching social studies at Franklin for four years. I have 183 students. I teach six periods a day. My free period is usually spent doing things here within the school for kids. I don't get a chance to use it as a prep period like I would. And it's the same for everybody here. I, I do believe I have the highest student load of 183. And uh, I'm pretty tired by the end of the day. And, and um, it's, it gets tough, it gets wearing. It's hard to go home and correct tests. I mean, you never seem to be caught up. Crowded classrooms are not a problem at Sauhegan High School, where the student-teacher ratio is just 13 to 1. My psychology class is extremely small. It, it's really a... How big is that? About 13 or 12. Yeah, my, my, yeah, my marketing class has yeah. eight people in it. My biggest class? Ooh, I don't know, probably, probably about 20. Last trimester I had a class with seven or eight people in it. How many students do you have all together? I see... 85, 90 kids in a day. Chris Owen teaches journalism at Sauhegan. I mean, I've heard horror stories of, you know, other places where a teacher would see 150, 200 kids in a day, and I, frankly, I don't see how that's, how any, any good thing can happen for the kids or the teachers in a situation like that. What would be wrong with that? Um, kids get lost. I mean, I think the, the, um, for learning to happen very effectively, it needs to be personalized as much as possible. And you can't get to do that if you have 180 kids? I don't think so. I, I try to do everything in my powers to give them the best education that they can have. And, and yes, maybe if I only had 15, I could spend more time with others. And, uh, but right now, that's, that's not what reality is. Reality is what goes on here. And, and do I envy those people? Up the road, yes and no. I, I think that it's probably a little easier for them. I wouldn't teach there. And, that's, and I think that's a problem. I mean, I think a lot of people, a lot of good, intelligent young people don't go into teaching because they face situations where it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of managing people rather than the fun part, which is engaging in ideas and getting to know kids and, and, and real teaching and learning. I have uh, four classes, and uh, I teach a total of 84 students in four classes. You're smiling, Debbie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's very fortunate. Uh, I teach over 100 kids. Uh, some of the teachers that I know teach 183 kids a day. So to hear those, those numbers, it just makes so much sense to me. How many classes a day do you have? I have to teach six out of seven periods. He teaches four, you teach six out of seven periods. You teach over 100 students, he has about 80. I, I, I wonder, I mean, it doesn't seem fair, does it? No, no. I mean, kids often reply to you um, at a teenage level, oh, it's not fair. And yet as adults, I come home sometimes at night and say to Scott, but it's not fair. It's not fair. <laughs> mm. But of course, Debbie, with six classes instead of four classes, and. 20 or 25 more students probably makes more money. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sense of humor. <laughs> After four years of teaching, Scott earns $31,000, while Deborah, who's been teaching for seven years, earns less than $24,000. At Scott's school, teachers can make as much as $50,000 a year. The most a teacher at Deborah's school can make is $34,000. Low pay leads to high turnover and teachers come and go. In the last two years, the Franklin School District has had to replace three quarters of its teaching staff. I've tried to come up through French in here. I've made it all the way up to French too. But we've gone through like, I don't know, ever since we started about 12 teachers. I don't know if anybody notices it, but there is a lot of good teachers that we've lost because we don't pay the teachers enough. The students at Franklin, when we have such a large turnover, it affects them deeply. Um, 
they sort of have a philosophy of, you're not going to stick around here. We're not worth you sticking around for sometimes. Teachers come and go at Franklin, but textbooks remain. Franklin High School spends $7,000 a year on textbooks. That's one third of what Sauhegan spends. I have an English book here. I got so many notes on this English, English book that I haven't even taken that. I mean, every page is full of scribble outs and underlining and every word is there got a definition next to it that must have been here for at least 10 years. And so I start to read in class and then I have to stop every five minutes because I don't know what a couple words are, sentences, because they're all scribbled out. So it's pretty tough. I'm currently using a civics government book from 1983. They have been unable to afford books. Um, I put in my whole budget for this year was strictly $3,200 worth of new government and civics books. And so in your book, Ronald, very, uh, Ronald, Ronald Reagan, Reagan is the man President. in the book. And um, talking about the Cold War and foreign policy, the basics were there. And now what we've done is we've gone on and applied it to uh, situations in Haiti. We've done it with situations in Somalia, Yugoslavia. And it, and it, it makes more work for me, but I can't see just having them plug away in a book that's 11 years old. More evidence that money makes a difference can be found in the two libraries. Franklin's budget for library books and materials is less than $7,000 a year. The library at Sauhegan, it's actually called the Information Center, can spend six times as much, nearly $44,000 for materials. A lot of that money is spent on technology. 50% of our information resources are coming from information technologies, computers, online services, CD-ROMs. And 50% are your traditional, familiar books, newspapers, magazines, videotapes. And behind this, those are all CD-ROMs? These are all CD-ROMs. This is a, um, is our, represents our back files of magazines. Students at Sauhegan can connect to computer networks all over the world and create their own videos in this editing room. The school has four fully equipped computer labs and computers in most classrooms. I, I guess we are lucky, in, in a sense. I mean, I couldn't imagine being in a, in a school where I didn't have all this available to me. Because, I mean, a lot of the people in the school don't have computers at home, and we're fortunate enough to have 30 com or 20 computers in each lab. I think we're falling really behind in technology in our school because computers is a big part of our society now. It's upcoming. and. Everybody's getting into it in businesses and things like that. And the best thing we have are these little old IBMs with these two drives in it. It takes like five hours to boot up WordPerfect, and that just doesn't cut it, you know. At Franklin High School, most of the computers date back to 1986 and 1987, and there aren't enough parts to go around. I'm switching the printer cables because we don't have enough printers in the school. And to all three of us in this section, share one printer because that's all we have. But normally you'd have cables would connect, you know, each computer yeah. would be connected to the printer. Don't yeah. you have enough cables? No, we just have this cable right here for our, for these two right here. And right now we're behind in technology because basically we're using floppy drives. We don't have a network. Um, the systems are outdated. I only have one computer that has a mouse. Excuse me, what were you just doing? You had to get another mouse? Yeah, I will. The ball of the mouse fell off. So I didn't know how to return it, so I just switched the mouse and then she fixed it. So what did you do? Just said, can I get another mouse? Yeah, well, uh, I tried to put it back, but I'm not too much of a computer genius. So I just asked for another one, and they went and got one. Most schools, <laughs> I think, would have a little bit more up to date equipment. Um, I think it's kind of a pain in the butt <laughs> to have to keep switching the printers, but it's fine because it's all we have, so we can live with it. Can you imagine being in a school that, where it was, oh, I don't know, 12 or 15 computers, and in fact, old computers with black and white monitors, right. and, and only one mouse among the whole deal? Right, I think we're pretty spoiled, actually, because we have a we have CD-ROM, and then we have all these computers, and we have laser printers and stuff. It's not... It's pretty convenient, actually, because we can do a lot of work that a lot of people can't do just because of our computers. I feel very limited. I feel that my abilities as a teacher are being limited or stifled, as the word may be. And I think that it's limiting what we can show our students. That's a skill we should know 
to make it in the world now, and I don't think that we're getting a fair shot at it if we don't have them now. Money also buys a stronger, more demanding curriculum. Sauhegan High School offers nine college-level advanced placement courses. Say you're applying to colleges, a lot of them look at your transcript, and they want to see a challenging course, challenging uh, workload. But then if you go to another school where they don't even offer AP courses, because maybe it's too small, or, or they just can't afford the extra teacher, then they're not going to get that AP course. By contrast, Franklin High School offers only one college-level course. You know, college should be something that, that you want to do and that you're able to do. But it's like, here, you, you can't do it. I don't feel, so that diminishes my expectations because I want to go on to school and I don't feel like I can. I feel like that's being taken away from me. Money makes a difference in lots of little ways. Franklin students rarely go on field trips while Sauhegan sends its students to Boston and New York City. Where are some of the places you've gone to? Oh, well, well, I have one. We went to a uh, reactor in our chemistry class last year. Bayside Expo Center in Boston. Where, where else? We went to the Woman Warrior, the play at Boston University. Mom brought you that Yeah. Here? Another difference. Franklin High School students often have to pay their own way or go without. I was involved in cheerleading for a while, and uh, we had to pay for our own shoes, our own socks, a lot of the uniforms, anything you wanted you had to pay for. Like books, and like we, like we had to buy our own books. For kids that maybe didn't have the money, they're gonna lose out. The kids have spent a lot of time asking questions and wondering why is it that 20 minutes up the road you have two high schools that have so much more to offer students than a school like Franklin. Do the kids at your school know what these kids at yes. Scott School have? We play um, some sports, compete against each other, so they have an opportunity to go down to his school. I know we went to one school that you walked in and they had rock climbing and they had I mean, the school is just unbelievable. You walked in, it was marble stairs. You feel bad because you go there and you play on a really good track and you do better and stuff. And then you come here and they come and look at your track and you just like, you don't really want to say anything because that track's like so bad. It's depressing because it's like, people are like, oh, you guys don't have soccer there, you don't have volleyball. And it's kind of like, you know, I don't know, it just kind of makes you feel like you're not as big as the other schools and it's harder to compete. Money talks even beyond high school. Last year, only one-third of the seniors at Franklin took the SAT, the Scholastic Assessment Test, and went on to college, where they may have found themselves unprepared. In this school, they don't, they keep telling you, you gotta do good, you gotta go to college, you gotta, but yet they don't, they don't help us out, because when we get into college, we're lacking what other, we're not up to par with other students from other schools. But at Sauhegan, nearly everyone takes the SAT, and 85% of the seniors go on to college. Well, I don't like, I don't like to compare uh, high schools because uh, it's unfair, because the system's unfair, and because basically money equals opportunity. And, and I guess that's what we're basically all saying, is that uh, for, in school, depending on how much money is put into education, you know, I have certain extra extracurricular activities for opportunities, uh, maybe more athletics, AP courses, honors, and, you know, and I don't know, it's pretty sad how it works, but that's the bottom line. You can't have quality education be an accident of geography, and that's what it is. I mean, if you're lucky enough to even be a poor kid born in a wealthy town, you have so many choices and so many opportunities. But if you're a poor kid and you're born in a poor town, I'll tell you right now, you're not going to get French, you're not going to get computers, you're probably not going to have football, and you're surely not going to have art or music. <laughs> and yet that child needs the same thing that the child needs in the more affluent community. Arnie Arneson's campaign for governor in 1992 raised questions about the fairness of New Hampshire's way of paying for public schools. Arneson promised to equalize spending between rich and poor districts with money from a new income tax. She lost. At one point, the campaign took her to Tilton Academy, a private school near Franklin. And I had two young men taking me around the campus at Tilton, and I was looking at the frescoes on the ceiling, and you know, those beautiful prep schools. And so I started making small talk with the guys, and I said, so where are you boys from? And I expected Connecticut or New York. And they said, where from? New Hampshire. I said, oh, really? Where are you from? And they said, we're from Franklin. And I said, Franklin? That's right next door. Why are you here? And the guy looked at me and said, well, Arnie, Franklin doesn't have a very good school. And our parents are really concerned about our academic future and whether we can get into college. And so they scraped together the money so we could come here. 
Now, I've heard that conversation, and I've actually had it with myself about my own kids, so I understood what was going on. We continued our small talk, and I said, any brothers or sisters? The kids had sisters. I said, oh, really? What prep school are they going to? They're going to Franklin High School. And I said, but you just told me that Franklin didn't have a very good school, and your parents were worried about your future. And they said, cut it out, Arnie. Our parents are struggling middle class. They could only afford to send one of us. <laughs> and the reason I tell that story over and over again is not because they chose the boy over the girl. It's because those parents were forced to make Sophie's choice. <laughs> do I choose my son or do I choose my daughter? And when you set people up like that, you are setting them up to fail. I think that our school system does very well despite what the naysayers in our own state say. And, uh, and I'm prepared to continue to work with the resources that are available and work with local communities to try to Im implement good sound educational practices that will lead to meaningful results by way of student academic achievement and performance. Ovid LaMontagne points out that overall, New Hampshire spends more question, per pupil than 28 so states and that New Hampshire's SAT scores are the highest on the East Coast. That proves, he says, that the public schools are working. I think, again, there's been an overemphasis on uh, the, you know, the bricks and mortar, uh, the number of books in the library. Uh, how relevant is it if you've got a full, if you have the Library of Com Congress on campus, if students aren't using it, if they can't read what's in it, if they can't understand uh, reading, or if they can't comprehend what's, what they're reading, it becomes irrelevant, frankly. Let me just tell you about two schools we've been to recently, the one in Franklin, where kids are using a textbook, and Ronald Reagan's still president, Michael Dukakis, still governor of Massachusetts. And then you go down to Amherst, that brand new high school where the kids have CD-ROMs connected to the internet, so on and so forth. Does that seem fair to you? Well, fair in what sense? I mean, you know, the question is, does it seem fair to me? Would I like every child to have a computer on the desk? Certainly. Is, it, uh, is, it, is that something that I should need to ask the taxpayers to provide for every student in the state? I don't think so. Uh, it, it certainly is advisable and desirable to have uh, all the resources, but there needs to be a cost-benefit analysis with that. If we're talking about teaching children uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, science, history, uh, a lot of that can be done without textbooks, frankly. And, and frankly, there are a lot of good, sound curriculum, uh, curricula that are being developed away from textbooks, uh, relying on the students and, and uh, the teachers working uh, in, in what you would call exploratory uh, fashion. Uh, I think there are many sound curricula strategies that do not, do not require a lot of resources. I'm always telling people that New Hampshire has, you know, pockets of excellence and acres of mediocrity. And the reason we've got that kind of result is because we have a system that assumes that a child's education is the responsibility only of a town, and that's not the responsibility of a state. Fundamentally, the system is sound, and it's a system that I'm, I'm proud to, to defend and to support. Because he says that all is well with the public system, but LaMontagne sends his own children to parochial school, the same one he attended. New Hampshire's Supreme Court does not believe all is well. Recently, the court ruled in favor of parents from five districts, including Franklin, who sued the state over unequal school spending. The justice has said it's the state's duty to provide a constitutionally adequate education to every child in the state. But they didn't say what constitutionally adequate means. Money brings opportunity. And uh, right now there are some, there are some p folks in this area who have more opportunity than others do. Um, there are some people who would tell you that's a natural order of life. I, I disagree with that. I, I think that, that it's the responsibility of the state to provide equal opportunity for all of its residents. I'm not a parent right now, but if I were a parent, I would want the very best for my child. And I sort of feel that way towards my, my students, that when I see the opportunities, and that's basically what it is, is a matter of opportunities. When I see the students at Scott School with all the opportunities available to them, and I think my kids are just the same, they're the same little human beings, and yet they don't have those opportunities. That's where the frustration comes in. Would you be willing to give up some of this and give it to the kids at Franklin? I would, because I, I think that people deserve, like, I, I mean, the facilities add to what we have, and I think that people should deserve the same opportunities that we have, like the computer systems that we but, have. But, and, but if you give some of it to them, you won't have it yourself. Yeah, but we still have some. Why do we need to have, like, all the stuff that we have? Maybe we should let students work it out. Whenever adults get involved, it inevitably means lawsuits. New Hampshire's case is only four years old. 
In some places, the legal battle has been going on for nearly 30 years. Here's a scorecard. Courts in these states have already ruled their school funding system unconstitutional. Add states with ongoing battles, either in the courts or in the legislatures, and most of the map lights up. Battling started in San Antonio, Texas, nearly 30 years ago. Now, you might think that after nearly 30 years, people would have gotten tired, calmed down a little bit. They haven't. Well, it's just a little bit irritating when you go and you play Edgewood and they come out and they have their brand new red shiny helmets and their brand new pads and jerseys and everything and you're saying, well, that, that's kind of our money that's going to buy them their brand new helmets and their brand new jerseys and, you know, support their football team. We supposedly won the case and supposed to get the money, but six years later we still haven't gotten any. Robbery is against the state law. I say it's guaranteed by the Texas Constitution and if, you know, you want to call that a dirty name, go ahead. You can't have a local vote and make robbery legal in your municipality. Rich and poor school districts in Texas have been fighting about school finance since 1968. Two of the combatants, Edgewood and Alamo Heights, couldn't be more different. The mostly Mexican-American community of Edgewood has below average income and low property wealth. Edgewood has never been able to raise enough money in taxes to fund its schools adequately. On the other side of San Antonio is the wealthy district of Alamo Heights. With so many large, expensive homes, Alamo Heights can keep its property tax rate low and still raise more than twice as much money for its schools as Edgewood. Back in 1968, conditions inside the Edgewood schools were terrible. Edgewood High School, built to hold 900 students, had 3,000 when Juan Silva, now a teacher, was a student in the late 60s. What was that like? I mean, how did they, how did they fit 3,000 students in here? Well, we had classes in the cafeteria. We had cluster classes. We had about 300 to 400 students per class, six periods a day. <laughs> we had one, one teacher, one lecturer on a microphone lecturing to 400 students. Wow. Right. What else was it like? I mean, were the conditions awful? Uh, the conditions were... were, were I guess they were fair, although things started to deteriorate towards my junior, senior year. Uh, as things would break, uh, they wouldn't get fixed. Uh, restrooms would break. Uh, the solution was just to lock them up and not be used anymore. By 1968, Edgewood High School students had had enough. They walked out in protest. A group of parents, including Demetrio Rodriguez, decided to sue. The schools were not in very good shape. Uh, Alex School was a... Uh... First and second floor were condemned by the city. Condemned? Condemned. The lawsuit, which was known as Rodriguez versus San Antonio, made Demetrio Rodriguez the focus of attention. I got threats, and some people called me a communist, and, uh, you know, I was trying to destroy the school, the, uh, school system in Texas. But if it takes a communist to do something like this, I think, well, I'm going to keep on doing it. The lawsuit filed by Rodriguez and the other parents charged that Texas was creating a gap between rich and poor students by making education dependent on local property wealth. They charged that this disparity was against the United States Constitution. Now that was a bold stroke. By filing the lawsuit in federal district court, not in a Texas state court, the lawyers hoped for a ruling that would eventually require equal spending in school for all school children in the United States, not just in Texas. And they won. In 1971, the federal district court ruled that spending between wealthy and poor districts was unequal and therefore unconstitutional. What was it like when you won? Well, we felt good, but, you know, like it is one of those things that they, we knew it was going to, they told us it was going to be, uh, you know, appeal. It was appealed all the way to the United States Supreme Court, which in 1973 overturned the original decision by a vote of five to four. Education, the court said, is a state matter. Whether schools are equitably funded is up to the states. Most of the states have been wrestling with the issue ever since. Back in Texas, Edgewood School District did not give up. Their case has been in and out of the Texas state court system ever since. Civil rights lawyer Al Kaufman represents Edgewood. This is the greatest opportunity I've ever had to work on a case like this. It's a major case. It's changing a system that was old and big and hurt a lot of kids. And, and it's a tremendous opportunity. We think that uh, we ought to have a good education every place. I mean, that's good policy. Nobody can be against that. The only question, who's going to pay for it? Your, your chief opponent in this is a lawyer named Al Kaufman, who's also been doing it for a long time. Tell me about Al Kaufman. 
Kaufman is my good friend, terribly misled. <laughs> he represents a lot of very conservative school districts, a lot of very conservative causes, and is an articulate person. And he and I have been fighting for years. We were in trial on the first Edgewood case for three months, the second Edgewood case for a month, and the third one for two weeks. And, and then he and I have been on the same panel debating these topics. I mean, he does some preaching, too. He's a very bright, uh, wonderful guy, but he's on the other side of the lawsuit. And uh, he's doing what he can to get more money for his clients uh, from people who have it. In order to really make it equal, we force some of these wealthy districts to share some of that tax money. From our view, this is a state system. I mean, the school districts have always felt that God gave them their boundaries and God gave them this property. In fact, it's all state constitution. These are all creatures of state law, and that's how they got these crazy school districts. I believe in the Constitution of Texas. And the side of the case that I'm on advocates following the Constitution. The Honorable Supreme Court of Texas is now in session. In 1989, the Texas State Court came up with a solution. Take money from wealthy districts like Alamo Heights and give it to poor districts like Edgewood. That solution, Senate Bill 7, is known in Texas as the Robin Hood Law. And Robin Hood no different in this country than he was in England. In England, those people that he gave money to thought he was a hero. Those he took it from thought he was a thief. So you say, when people say this is Robin Hood, you say hey, it ain't yours in the first place. That's right. Our, our view was this is all state money and the state constitution says it's supposed to be used to support the state system. What's wrong with that argument? Well, um, I try to say, we just got through trying that in Russia and found that it doesn't work. That's socialism. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, it's certainly not constitutional in our state. Here's how Robin Hood worked last year. Under the law, Alamo Heights was required to turn over $3.3 million in property tax money to poor districts in San Antonio, including Edgewood. The money paid for a summer program, not for football helmets. But is the Robin Hood approach a solution? Ask the students. It doesn't make sense to dilute something that's already going really strong. Why should you, why should you dilute it? Why should you change anything that's going on if, you're, if the school's producing? But, but maybe you're just speaking from a position of privilege. No, no. I mean, no, I, no, no, no I'm that's, saying that I'm saying wrong. that it's that that everyone should have the opportunity to an education, but why why should it be taken from a, a good established school system? Right, but, but the no, pie but is only so big. Yeah. You've got to give a little bit of yours in order to let Edgewood have a fair share. That's, that's, what but but why yeah. why why would you rather have would you rather have um, a, a good school? and then try to build up another school through uh, state funding? Or would you just want to cut, cut the school in half, the funding, and then try to make have, have two crummy schools? Yeah. And, and you think that's the choice? That, yeah. That's the choice that, that's happening right now. The Robin Hood's like, okay, well, we have a really bad school and we have a good school. So why don't we just have two mediocre schools? They don't know what we go through. They don't know what we go through just trying to learn in a chemistry lab that has the same materials since my parents came here. My parents are almost 50 years old already. It's not just the chemistry lab. Things are in disrepair all over Edgewood High. We're the same people. I mean, so why should we be treated different? Why should they get more money than us? But well, we want to learn too. You know, we were hoping that we would get something by our senior year. But I mean, now it's like, hopefully we'll have it for our, for our little brothers and sisters who come, who will be coming here. The Edgewood students want what Alamo Heights High School already has. Students at Alamo Heights may not like the Robin Hood law, but some do agree that Edgewood students deserve better. Should we ignore other youth, other people who can make a difference in our country just because they don't have anything? I mean, I'm coming here and I have gotten an excellent education, but if I had lived in Edgewood, you know, I could have I could have been born over there. I could have grown up and not even known my abilities. Why doesn't the state make it a priority and provide funds to bring everybody else up to this level if education is a priority? Technically, Al Kaufman's side is one. That is, today, Edgewood and Alamo Heights spend around the same amount of money per student. But Kaufman is not satisfied. There's fairly similar amounts of money spent in the two districts now, uh, if you just look at the dollars. If you look at, at the problems in the districts, Edgewood's still behind uh, because they, they have such a legacy of terrible facilities. Of They haven't been able to compete equally for teachers, so they, they haven't been able to hire and keep as high-quality teachers. They haven't had the money to, to buy the computers, to buy the equipment to buy, so they're way behind. 
And every year it costs more to educate their students than Alamo Heights. But the problem is that unless we get a really permanent solution in the courts, it's going to get worse in future years. So what's the solution to this? I mean, you have, you have these tremendous inequities. Mm -hmm. you, you acknowledge that yeah. or not? There, yes, yes. But um, inequities really doesn't have uh, anything to do with the question. The question is, um, the who's going to fund education? 28 years later, Demetrio Rodriguez is still involved, only now he's fighting for his grandchildren. Now, how long has this school had all these portable classrooms? Well, I think it had it for the last, uh, at least for the last 15 years. 15 years? Yes. Temporary classroom for yes. 15 years. That, uh, that doesn't seem right. Yep. So it doesn't seem right, but still some people say that money is not necessarily that what we want in education, and I think that money is one of the things that we've been fighting for. If money is not necessary, then why is it that people are fighting all these years? And the, the ones that got the money. So we need monies. We need money. No matter where the lawyers come and go, uh, interest groups come and go, and Demetrio just stays right where he was. He doesn't care who's in office, Democrat or Republican. He doesn't care whether they've helped some or not at all. Unless they're for absolute equality, he doesn't like them. And you're not quitting? No, sir. No, sir, I'm not going to quit. This is going to be going on until we get it or until I die. But Earl Luna and his side are not quitting either. You got to be kind of like the, the the story about the little boy who was going home every day, and he jumped on a much bigger boy, and that boy would whip him. And uh, finally, somebody said, "Look here, fella, why don't you quit starting a fight with that guy?" Said uh, he he whipped you every day. He said, "Oh no, he hadn't whipped me at all." What do you mean? I have seen it. He said, "Oh no," he said, "He's just a little bit ahead right now. This fight's not over." <laughs> Texas clearly has not figured out how to provide adequate educational opportunity for all its students. Taxpayers no doubt are hoping for a solution that will not cost more money. In fact, taxpayers everywhere are saying no to increase school spending by voting down school budgets. That means when schools want to spend more money, they have to raise it themselves. By selling ad space, for example, these ads in Colorado Springs brought in an additional $100,000. School fairs are a tried and true way of raising money. The Beverly Hills Public Schools raised $400,000 at events like this carnival. Time is money, and in some districts, parents donate their time as school cooks and cashiers. That saves the schools and the taxpayers money. Another technique, advertise. Haddonfield's public schools have empty seats, so they're trying to entice parents from neighboring districts. Bring your children and pay tuition. Private money is actually helping build this new middle school brick by brick in Highland Park, Texas. To get around the state's Robin Hood law, Highland Park parents created a private foundation to raise money for the schools. For $100, you can have a personalized brick in the school's entryway. The foundation is even paying salaries. Another fundraiser brought in enough money to pay the salary of this elementary school's Spanish teacher. The money raised by these efforts is above and beyond your tax money, that $220 billion. Public schools haven't always been this expensive, but then again, everything costs more than it did 40 years ago. Back in 1954, a new Ford cost only $2,000. Today, it will cost you 10 times as much. A gallon of gasoline cost 23 cents in 1954. Now it's six times that. A hamburger was 25 cents in 1954. Not anymore. But the price of schooling has risen faster than almost anything else. In 1954, it cost a couple of hundred dollars to send a child to public school for a year. In 1994, our national per pupil spending average was nearly 30 times higher. Educators like Keith Geiger, president of the National Education Association, defend the increase. I don't think we spend enough money in our public schools, and if you look at the commitment that is made to public education as compared to other countries, I don't think the commitment is there. In fact, the United States spends a lot per pupil. What do other countries pay? Only Sweden and Switzerland spend more, while Germany, the United Kingdom, France, and Japan spend less. Keith Geiger says our schools cost more because they do more. 
we're trying to educate a lot more children. We're trying to educate a lot more children with diverse backgrounds. Now in the state of California, a third of all the students are non-American students. They come from other countries. A lot of them are speak another language as their first language. And then the other part of that, though, is the cost of the lunch program, the food program, the health program. I think we have to take a look at that. In 1954, public schools could and did legally deny education to handicapped children. They were institutionalized or kept at home. But in 1975, with the passage of the Education of All Handicapped Children Act, schools were required to serve all children, whatever the cost. Providing these services, educating mentally and physically challenged children, teaching new immigrants, providing food and health care, has changed schools' role. Everything has become more complex and more expensive. What's happened to achievement since schools have taken on all these extra duties? I think the data shows that the achievement especially among female and minorities, has been gradually going up. I think the white males have been kind of staying stagnant. But I think, in the, especially in the math and the science, there's a lot of data to show that the achievement has been slightly going up. While some groups have improved, the overall news is not good. Since 1954, the average scores on the SAT, the Scholastic Assessment Test, have dropped 69 points. What hasn't dropped is spending. No matter what happens to student enrollment, spending seems to go in only one direction, up. We compared the 1954 and 1994 school budgets in one small city, Stamford, Connecticut, to see what's happened to school spending over the years. Back then, only 22% of the budget went to school administration. Today, administration takes 39% of the budget. In 1954, Stamford had 12,800 students. Today, it has 13,200. That's an increase of only 400 students, about 3%. Forty years ago, Stanford spent just over $4 million on public education. Today, it spends nearly $107 million. That's an increase of 2,675%. Have teacher salaries gone up 2,675% over the last 40 years? Well, if they had, then last year in Stanford, Connecticut, the average teacher would have made $135,000. That did not happen. Last year, the average teacher's salary in Stanford was $53,000, not $135,000. So where is that money going? Here's a clue. Recently, the Stanford Advocate published a list of the 100 highest paid city employees. Most of them are school administrators, with an average salary of $90,000 a year. Officials of the Stanford schools refused our request for an interview. On average, you have less than 50, 50 cents on the dollar going to the classroom. In some cases, like New York City or your urban districts, it's less than 30 cents on the dollar going to the classroom. That's atrocious. If you were to take uh, average districts that spend about five to $6,000 a child, and you take uh, 25 youngsters in a classroom, <clears throat> there's a lot of money in that classroom at $6,000 a child. There's maybe $150,000 or $170,000, and the teacher may get $65,000 of it. You know, where does the rest of it go? Where is it going? It's going to the bureaucracy, the bureaucrats, the rules, the regulations, people to carry out the administration of school buildings. Bureaucrats are bad people. Bureaucrats aren't bad people. Bureaucracy is bad. It's the system that's bad. Maybe the system is bad, but before we dismantle it, let's think about what that would mean to a local economy. After all, public school systems provide meaningful work, honest jobs, for an awful lot of people. In many of uh, our communities, and especially in the rural communities of the United States, if you take a look at the school district, it's probably the largest employer in the community. So if you say we're going to make all of these cuts in the school, you obviously are taking right out of your economy and at the same time you're taking away the taxes need to fund it but you're also taking away jobs so in many of the districts it's the largest employer in the district in clay county west virginia the public schools are the largest employer in all 300 people work for the schools including 41 bus drivers a school bus driver edits the local newspaper and owns this inn a school bus driver is the co-owner of this auto shop. The other co-owner, his brother, teaches at the high school. All right, my name's Tim Butcher, and I run this store here. And I work for the Board of Education. I drive a school bus, and I'm also the mayor of Clay. 
Wow. Three hats. Three hats. In a town once known for its coal and its lumber, now the jobs to get are in the classroom or behind the wheel of a school bus. For serving as mayor, Tim Butcher is paid only $250 a month, and business has been slow at his store. But as a Clay County school bus driver, he makes $12,100 a year plus benefits. The job as a school bus driver, is that important to you very, economically? Very important. Those are, those are scarce jobs. I mean, those are highly prized jobs, it seems. And there was a time that uh, they, the board members had to go out and try to recruit bus drivers because no one wanted to do it. And now uh, the people that are around want the bus driving jobs. Why is that? What's happened? The jobs are just scarce. Jobs are scarce in this county. Six of the nine children in this family have become teachers in the Clay County Schools. Of the four singing Tanner boys, two are school bus drivers in Clay County. A third Tanner, Kenneth, is head of vocational education at the high school. And that's just the beginning. So, Kenneth, you know, you said family. Do you have a lot of family working for the school system? I do. I have, uh, there's a couple of teachers who uh, are, uh, we're related. Also, several bus drivers and other personnel that are related to the Tanners, not in the immediate family, but actually uh, all of us did come from one single individual. You ready to draw me a family tree? Uh, I'll try. Uh, let's see. There's a gentleman called Sammy uh, Tanner. And Sammy had several uh, boys and some girls. Uh, uh, Samuel had a, excuse me, Sammy had a Russell uh, who had an Arnold. Arnold was a bus driver. Arnold has a son, Gary, who, uh, in fact, Arnold and Gary are still driving. And uh, so also, and there's Romy, who was my grandfather, and uh, Romy had Charles. And of course, Charles had Kenneth, which is me. And also, Romy had Ronald, and Ronald is also a bus driver. In all, 17 members of the Tanner family worked for the schools in one capacity or another. How did you end up being a teacher? Uh, I, won't, I always, when I went to school here, I honestly was very impressed with this school. Uh, I loved being here. The teachers cared, and I got to know my teachers real well. And I said, hey, this is what I want to do. Ken Tanner is not alone. Other families who want to stay close to home turn to the jobs that will keep them there. Mike Mullins, Ken Tanner's colleague, also came back to Clay to teach. So did Mike's sister, Dale. She teaches reading and social studies at Clay Elementary School. Another sister, Nada, teaches reading at Clay Middle School. And Mike's sister, Dawn, teaches English and social studies at the middle school. Two other siblings also teach in Clay County, and another is currently studying to become a teacher. The Mullins are proud to be teachers in Clay, proud that their three largest schools have been recognized as national schools of excellence. There's this funny thought going through my head that this is the, keeps the economy afloat, this mm -hmm. education in here. And, but if you do your job well, you're going to produce well-educated young people who may leave and not Absolutely. come back. That's Many of them have to leave because there's no economic opportunities for them here, and it's sad. Uh, you know, it's sad to see those kids walk off the stage after they graduate and know you'll never see them again mm. because they have to go somewhere else for a job. We're at the catch-22. We don't produce kids who can go out. They'll stay here and have children, but they will not, won't be able to do anything here. But you'll have kids and then to we, teach. But we have kids to teach. And if we do a great job, then we are going, they are going to leave here and marry and have their children elsewhere. How many of you would like to come back and work or stay in, in Clay County? It's hard to have ambitions and do what you want to do and stay in Clay because the, I guess the way to put it, the resources for working are so limited. Actually, I want to go to college and major in journalism and then try to find a job at somewhere outside of Clay County. Welfare is about the only other thing in Clay County besides coal trucks and teaching. I want to be a teacher. I'm sorry? Teacher. You do? Yeah. And why? How come? I don't know. It's about the only way I can stay around Clay County, and that's about the only good job around here. I, I was trying to imagine Clay 
county as a country. <laughs> the free state. The free state, state, with the state of Clay. <laughs> the free state of Clay. Your balance of payments would be oh. terrific because money flows in. 80% of the money that the school system gets comes from the state. So the money's flowing in. 80% of our money does, yes. Right. So the product you make is well-educated kids. Mm -hmm. You export those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a fair trade. Problem is you don't have enough ki more kids. Or the declining enrollment is a major problem because we, you know, we maybe we're doing such a good job that they're all leaving, and so we have less and less product to work with. And because of the way the funding works, we'll have less and less money to do it with. It may be that the only way out of all this wrangling about money is to look beyond the dollars. The problem we've had for the last 10 to 15 years is we have isolated school finance as an issue. And by doing that, we've done absolutely nothing to improve our schools. Jeannie Allen believes that to have better schools, we need less regulation. We think we've been holding them accountable. We've passed accountability bills. We've raised graduation requirements. We've raised teacher certification. These things don't work. These are all things that we tell schools to do. We haven't said, we're sending you a pool of money. You're supposed to educate kids. Here's the basic measurements our state, our community uses. If you don't succeed, that's when we'll tie the strings. Oh. As opposed to, we've been telling them, here's strings. Now try to perform. Try to perform even though we've told you what to do. 24 hours a day. We can't do that anymore. Albert Schenker agrees with Allen's analysis and compares the U.S. system with that of other countries. The United States has more supervisors and administrators, more bureaucracy uh, than any of these other systems. So basically, these other systems reward their teachers. They hire teachers that they are confident will be able to do a good job. They hire people who stay on the job because they are treated well and they are highly respected. And then they don't have all this bureaucratic setup. Whereas in the United States, we hire a lot of people because we just grab them and they're available. And then we don't trust them because they, after all, if they're willing to work for this little money, something must be wrong with them. And then we hire a whole bunch of more expensive people to watch what they're doing all the time, uh, which is not a very smart way to run a system. You know, Al Shanker always says that if you put schools on a level playing field, say public schools on a level playing field with private schools, they'd be able to compete. Let's put them on a level playing field. Let's take all the strings off. Let's send the money locally. Let's make them accountable just to tell us how they're spending it every year, and that's it. And if they want to spend it on bilingual education, they can. If they want to spend it on throwing all the desks out and sitting in a circle cooperative learning, great. If they want to put the desks in and have rote memorization and phonics, great. Let them do whatever they think is best for their community with their money. And then we'll see improvement. There is no country in the world that does what some of these conservatives want. What the conservatives are willing to do is, is take the dice and roll them because uh, they're willing to destroy a system that exists now. They're not willing to put in a system that works in other countries. Instead, they're willing to try something that nobody's ever tried before. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, then what do you do? They've destroyed it all. Uh, I, I think they are not conservatives. Uh, I think they're radicals. They're not conserving or preserving anything. Uh, I think that they are so hostile to the idea of government doing anything uh, that they're willing to be the opposite of conservatives. That is, they're willing to take terrible chances uh, with an institution that works in all of the countries and could be made to work here as well. For Albert Schenker, the first step to improvement is higher standards with real consequences. Why work hard? If you're, if you're a high school kid, why not uh, come home, turn on the TV set, uh, take out your, uh, uh, your Walkman and turn on the rock and go out on the streets and, and, uh, and have a good time? As long as either mommy or daddy or Uncle Sam pays the tuition, 95% of the colleges and the universities will take you. And employers aren't going to ask for your grades or your transcripts. Anybody ever heard of McDonald's asking, uh, what are your grades in school before they hire one of these youngsters? So we don't have any incentives. We don't send these strong messages that other countries do. And as long as that's the case, uh, youngsters are not going to take school seriously. They're going to say, look, Colleges don't care whether I'm learning anything or not. They're going to admit me. Employers don't care. They don't ask for grades. What's bugging you? What should be bugging all of us is the waste of human potential. Too much money, too little money. Those aren't the only questions. Maybe we ought to ask, what do we want for our children? What do we want them to grow up to be? 
and what resources do we need to get that job done? We call this program, It's Your Money, but more importantly, they're your children. South Carolina ETV and ACSN.